we have a cybersecurity solution that uses blockchain technology. Uh, we are now part of uh, uh, the Airbus Accelerator Program, uh, Co-Innovation -Accel Co Acceleration Program, uh, and also recently got listed as one of the top uh, 20 cybersecurity ventures worldwide. Apart from that, I'm also the co-founder of a company called Blockchain Works in Singapore. It's a blockchain design studio where we design uh, a number of solutions that fall bank in the uh, blockchain space. One of the things we're looking at is a digital banking platform powered by blockchain technology. And uh, last but not the least, uh, there is an exchange called uh, the Gibraltar Stock Exchange uh, late last year announced the launch of the Gibraltar blockchain exchange where you're going to be able to trade, you know, the stock exchange where you trade stocks and things like that. The blockchain exchange is where you're going to be able to trade crypto and things like that. And I'm the chief blockchain officer uh, as part of that team. Great. Now, uh, after a quick introduction, how many of you have heard about blockchain and have kind of seen something in that space? Most of you? Okay. Now comes the interesting question. How many of you either own or trade or have dabbled in Bitcoin or some of the other cryptocurrency. How many of you have that? Fantastic. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, this space is getting uh, hotter than hot and faster and, and, and it's moving really fast these days. But last year was a phenomenal year when it came to uh, both Bitcoin and blockchain as a technology, the cryptocurrency space as well as the blockchain space. One thing that clearly emerged was the divergence, right? So you have blockchain which emerged as you know on its own as a technology and started to make its way into enterprise into enterprise it so number one you had a number of consortiums coming together uh, you had the technology consortium things like hyperledger uh, the hyperledger foundation but uh, you also had uh, the ethereum enterprise alliance and things like that you know starting to get formed and, and and those coalitions coming together but you also saw a lot of use case based consortiums that started to get formed which is around supply chain for example where you saw uh, port authorities shipping companies uh, and, and 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 even customs and folks like that starting to get together and explore end-to-end -end tracking and tracing of uh, you know cargo on a blockchain so that is one space where blockchain emerged. On the other side, you of course saw the rise of cryptocurrencies, things starting with simple like Bitcoin, which was around $1,000 at the start of 2017, landed up close to $15,000 and uh, you know, somewhere in December, right? Uh, but apart from Bitcoin and Ethereum and the Ethers and Ethereum and things like that, you also saw a whole rise of cryptocurrencies. So what you had is, you know, thousands of companies that raised anywhere between three to four billion dollars by just issuing tokens, right? And so what you also landed up the end of the year with is about a thousand different cryptocurrencies, which suddenly took the market cap of all cryptocurrencies somewhere close to 600 billion dollars. Now that is a big sum. So on the back of that, you have something even more interesting happen, which you see a lot of intermediaries come together, right? So. Uh, things like financial funds, hedge funds, and things like that, that started to form crypto funds. There are a thousand cryptocurrencies. I've got to, how do I pick which one? And then, you know, I, you know I'm a high net worth individual. The guy's like, hey, I want to park 2% of, uh, uh, you know, of, 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 of my asset portfolio in, 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 in these currencies. Great, hedge fund manager, can you manage that for me? Asset manager, can you look? So you saw a lot of that. But last but not the least, you had entire nation states, entire countries decide to move towards the blockchain, right? For example, in Dubai, uh, you have the Dubai Future Foundation, which announced that by 2020, all government-related documentation will be exclusively on the blockchain. So now what you have is a rush where all companies and all sorts of agencies and government departments rushing to comply with that. Number one. Number two, if, if, if some of you are from Singapore out here, of course, you know that uh, the MAS piloted uh, the Singapore dollar on the blockchain, right, as part of uh, Project Ubin. Again, not for retail use, but this was basically to look at settlement among banks and different financial institutions. And so you had a whole lot of things and, and which made 2018, of course, a very exciting, uh, 2017 a very exciting year. Of course, come 2018 and then you've seen the cryptocurrency uh, pretty much halving in value, uh, you know, many of them falling way beyond half also. Uh, so that was 2017, which was a great year. But within that year, within that same great rise and exploration and everything, you of course had a, you have, the industry of course saw its challenges. 
So number one, you had wallets being breached, you have, you, you have ICOs getting uh, hacked, you have complete exchanges getting hacked, South Korea's UBIT got hacked and lost about 4,000 Bitcoin. The latest at the start of 2018 is, uh, which is CoinCheck in Japan, which lost half a billion dollars worth of tokens. That's pretty much one of the biggest I think we've had in date. So, and that's when regulators and things like that uh, and, and others started getting cautious, right? Uh, of course, uh, I, I don't know when my previous, uh, the previous speaker mentioned it briefly where you saw cryptocurrencies also becoming the de facto uh, choice of currency or whatever you call it for a whole lot of uh, illicit activities. For example, Bitcoin pretty much established itself as the choice of currency for hackers. Last year, you had the two big global uh, incidents, which are WannaCry and Petty at the malware. And then uh, those guys wanting uh, ransom payments in uh, Bitcoin. So, and, and, and so it had a fair share of uh, challenges not and, and, and some of them of course went to the extreme step right where you have uh, where you uh, some of these scams and things forced regulators for example in China to say hey we we have a carpet ban we said uh, none of this is acceptable so no more ICOs and so now you have a lockdown of these things in in places like China South Korea of course got cautious but then as I hear today uh, you have uh, the Japanese regulator which is now suing a Hong Kong based exchange uh, for operating illegally in the country. The challenge there being uh, that is, as of today, one of the world's biggest cryptocurrency exchange. So you can imagine, and now the Japanese regulator after that. So a number of things, and you have a number of challenges that the problem happens is if cryptocurrencies or if blockchain has to go mainstream, you've got to have institutions coming on board. It can't be just a bunch of enthusiasts, people like us in the room, you know, that go and start to dabble in this technology. You need the institutions coming on board and to have them on board, of course, these things can't be happening. So how do you bring out security? How do you bring about uh, things like regulation and, 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 and pieces of that in, this, in, that, in place, right? And that's where you're seeing uh, organizations like the Gibraltar Stock Exchange, which is an EU, a, a European Union regulated stock exchange announcing uh, the Gibraltar blockchain exchange, which is the goal is to be the world's first uh, regulated uh, token sale platform and cryptocurrency exchange, right? So now today, for example, if I have a large bank and it wants to, uh, you know, in, uh, have, have customers invest in cryptocurrencies, hey, there is a, le a legitimate regulated institution where it can go and uh, start. Uh, start to participate. Is that the right way? Is that the way it's going to be in the future? I don't know. This industry changes so fast, right? It's, we're, we're right at the start. Uh, but yes, you're seeing a lot more regulation and security-based issues coming around. Uh, again, this is more of a map. So today, uh, after all these things, there's no, there's no country uh, or you can't say that it's, it's, it's legal or it's absolutely illegal. If you look across the globe and you look at the spread of green, yellow, and the, you know, the more orange and the red, the red is where it's absolutely unacceptable. The green is where they say, great, it's fine right now, including Singapore where you know, MAS has taken a very, uh, MAS has taken a very positive approach to saying, hey, let's explore how this thing evolves, right? And then you've got uh, certain countries with our wait and watch. But the main thing is, this map evolves every day, pretty much every day. Uh, earlier this year, and, 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 and if you see India in orange there, earlier this year you had the finance minister of the country actually uh, during the budget session state how uh, Bitcoin is no longer accepted as legal tender and they're going to actually clamp down on that. And then I was talking, uh, but also reading about a couple of exchanges which are now uh, uh, really unhappy because they've lost, their business has dropped by over 90%. These are the cryptocurrency exchanges. And there's no law signed in which says that it is illegal. But yes, the way the government is headed, they completely support blockchain, but they are apprehensive and they're going to be clamping down on things like Bitcoin and trading of other cryptocurrencies. And, well, okay. So my opinion when it comes to the tokenization and the whole crypto space, I think we're just at the start. So in 2017, what you saw is a whole lot of ICOs, initial coin offerings, token sales and things like that. Remember, this is what you have today is just blockchain companies doing that. A handful of blockchain companies, early adopters, fast moving companies uh, or, or really new ones that have started to adopt this market, this approach to market to raise funds, right? 
But tomorrow, what you're going to see is a much larger second wave, as I call it, where you'll see digital ventures. So things like e-commerce companies, mobile companies, social media firms, and things like that also start to go into tokenization and look at using digital tokens as form of payments or as forms of value exchange. Uh, mobile apps, IoT applications, and things like that. That's the second phase. And I think that you're going to see part of that this year and then extend into 2019. But the real big part is beyond that. And that's where you'll see all sorts of brick and mortar companies, coffee shops, airlines, shipping firms, and things like that start to tokenize, start to use digital tokens, start to use tokens as a medium of value exchange and things like that, right? Again, uh, now, this is how I see. So 2018 and then 2019, 2020. Uh, that's when you're also going to see regulation come in because manufacturers, retailers are not exactly going to jump in until these things start to fall in place. But regulations and, and, and you know, governance is going to evolve over time. Uh, but a lot of companies have actually started to jump the gun. So if I remember right, uh, Singapore Airlines has actually already started to pilot its uh, Chris Flyer miles on the blockchain. So you could actually have Chris Flyer miles that could be simple tokens that you have in a wallet and could exchange it for different value. Uh, I know of a company that's doing uh, marine maritime asset investment. So what they're trying to do is take vessels, ships, and uh, tokenize them on the platform and basically let anybody like you and me simply just go and uh, invest in uh, uh, vessels using either fiat currency like you, uh, dollars euro or simply invest in these ships using Bitcoin or Litecoin or some other cryptocurrencies. Uh, what, they, what that basically says is I can't afford to buy a ship today, but if I can have fractional ownership of that, I can probably own 1% of a ship and if I want to invest in it as an asset class, tomorrow I will have that option. Today, of course, we don't, right? Uh, I also know of a project that's doing the exact same thing with real estate properties. I would like to participate in a social special economic zone or you know one of these large uh, uh, things. And uh, of course, again, so one is you want to, uh, you, it's meant for institutions to be able to uh, get into these uh, otherwise illiquid asset classes, but also for common people. And you basically democratize investment into the, some of these investments that today are only available to a select few, right? So what that does is these platforms basically do three things. Number one is they offer fractional ownership. They take a large asset and break it down into pieces so that any so that a lot more people can invest in them. Number two, they of course create a lot more liquid, liquidity. So by tokenizing it, suddenly you have a lot more liquidity to be able to invest in, get in and get out. And last but not the least, of course, you create a very vibrant secondary market. So this is, uh, this is where uh, we see the market, or where I see the market moving. And the real big wave will come at the far end where you've got manufacturers, even coffee shops trying to tokenize. However, on the point of coffee shops, uh, I last heard that Starbucks is already piloting uh, stuff on the blockchain. Uh, very quickly, where uh, you go, uh, and this is just a snapshot of Asia since we're in this part of the world today. Uh, where in Asia are you seeing uh, uh, acceptance? So, for example, I know a lot of companies that are doing tokenizations and ICOs in Singapore right now, but even in Hong Kong. Uh, of course, a lot uh, less in Vietnam, of, of, while Vietnam is actually marked in red. I was down in Vietnam two weeks ago speaking at the Vietnam Blockchain Week, and uh, I saw at least, <laughs> uh, I met at least four to five uh, local companies that were trying to do an ICO. Uh, again, they might domicile it locally or they might simply domicile it in a more friendly place like a Singapore or a Hong Kong. Again, Japan is one country which is very welcome. In fact, in Japan, you can simply go to small shops and even they will accept Bitcoin from you. Uh, from you. Of course, there's a slight markup which they will charge because of the processing fee associated with it. Australia is another great place where uh, one of the largest uh, token sales last year from a company called Power Ledger uh, was actually um, based out of Australia, and they did a fantastic uh, piece there around green energy and the whole energy uh, token space. Uh, and here's the interesting thing. So I was having a chat with a financial institution, one of the world's largest investment banks. So they invited me to speak at one of the uh, at, at, at the Asia Forum, and annual forum, and they have a very unique uh, challenge. What they're saying is that uh, some of our clients are high net worth individuals, ultra and high net worth, net worth individuals, but even some of our uh, institutional in customers are asking us, how can we move a small part of our portfolio into cryptocurrencies, into Bitcoin, into Litecoin or whatever? 
Now, of course, they can't simply go and buy, uh, buy on, a, on some random exchange, right? And uh, one thing that we evolved there is one way these financial institutions can um, participate in, 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 in the token economy and help their customers also participate is, let's assume they set up an exchange in-house, so they have their own cryptocurrency exchange. They set up a trading desk which buys tokens for themselves but also for their customers on their own exchange. And then they basically uh, just tie in into a, a liquidity aggregator or to uh, one of the regulated exchanges, either, for example, a coin in Japan or the Gibraltar blockchain exchange in Gibraltar, and basically to facil facilitate liquidity and provide liquidity on their internal exchange. Now, once they have the exchange in-house, they can wrap risk, security, compliance, and everything around that to ensure they are completely compliant. Now, is this the way to go ahead and is this like the future? No. But then today, if they, if they need, today and tomorrow, if they need to kind of uh, help their customers, uh, you know, move some, uh, some of their portfolio in, or add uh, cryptocurrencies into their portfolio, this is pretty much, uh, again, what we evolved, one of, the, one of the most legit ways to do that. Uh, so, Again, very quickly, just to share what we are doing. So we are, uh, one thing that we built is a token sale platform that provides an administrative dashboard, which helps any uh, startup that's looking to raise money via an ICO. It gives them a simple, uh, elegant dashboard to kind, to kind of go and play, uh, to, to do their token sale. Uh, again, you need a smart contract and everything that's lying underneath, but then if you have a smart way to administer your token sale, it basically lets you uh, kind of, um, uh, do it in a structured, elegant, and organized way. And of course, once the token sale is done, let's assume you're doing a DAO or a decentralized autonomous organization, then it also helps you manage that going ahead, uh, administer the DAO uh, in a smart way. Uh, last but not the least, we also have built an exchange, which we call, uh, uh, we don't operate the exchange, we just have the software. So we built the software, it's called CryptET, which we label as the world's most secure institutional grade digital asset exchange. Again, this one came out of the same, uh, out of uh, our uh, conversations with the, 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 a couple of investment banks which wanted to establish something like this in-house. So what they would do is use our software to set up the exchange uh, in, internally. Of course, we take care of security, we wrap risk, which, you, which means you've got your anti-money laundering kind of things, your KYC and stuff like that, wrap the exchange with that, and then set up an internal trading desk that can comfortably trade on this now regulated exchange with liquidity coming in from either liquidity aggregators or uh, regulated uh, cryptocurrency exchanges out there. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that and uh, take some questions because I thought we'll make this a little more interactive. Any questions, any thoughts? Yep. From a layman's point of view, I was looking at your timeline of 2017 to 2019. Yep. Like 2019, you were, you were, you were saying that um, you expect, I mean, you imagine coffee shops and whatnot would have taken up, which would then mean that laymen like myself would be using the coins to pay off for my coffee. I mean, is that something that it's realistic for 2019. Uh, okay, let me take a step. Let me answer that in two pieces. But your last part that you mentioned, pay a coffee shop with Bitcoin, there are a couple of places that you can actually pay for coffee using Bitcoin, right? But what I meant is where these guys will start to have their own tokens. So they will move into tokenization. So you could have a coffee shop token that rather than having to carry money every day or carry some form, you just carry, uh, you know, you have your ID and um, you, you, you use that to pay for your, your coffee, right? Even today, if you, uh, you do have cards which you can preload money on and go and pay. But that means that card has nothing to do with you. If I get your card, I can use that tomorrow, right? But if you have a, 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 a cryptocurrency wallet or, or a digital token, then you're identified on the, you have an identity on the blockchain, which by whatever form of identification can know it's you. And then based on the, either the tokens you've accumulated or you bought or you have, you can simply pay with that. Uh, and coming back to your point is, uh, Yes, that's when I see that happening because these guys will st are still in a wait and watch world, right? They're not the first to adopt a crypto, some a technology like this. 
But like I said, some of them are jumping the gun, like this project that I was talking about, Marine Chain, which says, hey, we're moving, you can buy a vessel on the blockchain uh, with cryptocurrencies, right? Fractional ownership. You can buy property with, uh, by paying with cryptocurrencies. Uh, uh, like I said, Singapore Airlines piloted the, uh, the frequent flyer miles on the blockchain, which means now I have a wallet with some tokens in it and I can do a whole lot of things with the tokens now rather than just going to a catalog and trying to, uh, you know, you know, buy something that I don't even want there because I have no other way to use those tokens. Sorry, someone at the back. Yeah. So, uh, thank you so much for the positive uh, and uh, the slides. I, I, I also have the same question about uh, the reality and the nature of the timeline that you have mentioned, right? <coughs> there, is, there is a side of, uh, in, in the cryptocurrency world, they feel that the next couple of years or four years, is, it's more of a infrastructure building. Uh, because Bitcoin can only seven transactions per second, right now it's just 10 to 15, right? So, and you know, in the timeline, real estate. Uh, Correct. So, uh, one thing remember most of these uh, and, and and so i uh, i i was at a forum last time and someone asked me when will we see cryptocurrency or blockchain 3.0 and i was like wait 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 we are not even at blockchain 1.0 so 3.0 is a long way off so what you have is a very fast evolving technology it's still very very much in its infancy so it's not even at 1.0 it's just emerging right now you're starting to see certain you know blockchains that are out there that are of course the, the problem with bitcoin and ethereum as it is today they use proof of work which can is absolutely not scalable but Ethereum is already looking at moving to proof of stake and you have a whole lot of uh, cryptocurrencies today that are that go beyond uh, proof of stake and are much more powerful block from a technology perspective as far as the blockchain is concerned, right? So you'll see that evolving. And uh, in fact, uh, so when I said that, they said like, how do you see, so do you think that by you know 2019, you'll have a faster block? I was like, I don't know. Tomorrow you might have someone announce something, something that's you know thrice the speed or five times the speed, right? Uh, I know that there's been research going on, and there are a couple of chains that are you know coming out. They're not like not yet released and things like that that match the Swift network and that can match the Visa and the Mastercard network because you need to get to that speed till coffee shops and things like that can start uh, accepting these transactions, right? Now. If you have one coffee shop or you have a local coffee shop, fine, a local chain, five, six, seven. What about the global chains? What about the regional chains that are pan-Asian or pan-European? They've got thousands of shops that, need, that have people every morning, 9 a.m., ordering tons of coffee. So can the blockchain handle that? So yes, it will need to evolve. But having said that, I, you're already seeing a whole, whole lot of new blockchains that sway a long way from the proof of works and that can actually address uh, some of the, the, the credit card networks that you have today in place. Yeah? Well, I think uh, when we look at uh, you know, the popularization of the cryptos, one of the perspectives that is not often presented is the fact that on the supply side, that is the issuers, they can do whatever they want. You know, it's no different to issuing crypto vis-a-vis -vis play money. In, in like the monopoly game. Correct. But what is important is the demand side. So why would people want to forsake yet and have a whole pockets of different cryptos to use on a you know, daily exchange, buying coffee, buying lunch? You know, <laughs> what we don't really Good one. one in terms of like do we have a phone software based your wallet or do we carry you know some kind of hardware wallet that will be universal you know it seems to me the timeline of 2019 uh, is very optimistic but at the same time whether it's optimistic or not uh, it doesn't look to take into account the demand side absolutely and also another very fundamental perspective is the fact that how would you know consumers feel if your crypto exchange rate go up and down yeah. like a yo-yo. Yeah. I mean, there is a fundamental need for human perception to say, okay, the price of certain item is comparable between today, yesterday, Correct. and tomorrow. Correct. If you keep on having to work in your mind, oh, uh, is it like similar to what it was yesterday? Has it yeah. Up by <laughs> Good point. It doesn't work. Correct. And uh, 
Let me answer that in two parts. And that's why I completely agree with you. You've got to get institutions coming on board. And that's why we are building institutional grade exchanges and things like that. Because still you don't have the larger pool, the larger uh, organizations come on board, that stability is not going to come in just by a bunch of enthusiasts running something like, like you said, monopoly money, right? But here's the reason why it, there are a few very key uh, features of this, right? Uh, I'm not advocating for Bitcoin or something, but today, uh, if I, uh, uh, let's say, I, 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 probably not Singapore, but if I have uh, the Malaysia, I, I have some Malaysian ringgit and or I have uh, the Vietnamese dong or another or the Korean, uh, you know, the, 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 the local currency. And I went to India, for example, there's no way they'll accept that. Now, suddenly Bitcoin is Bitcoin everywhere number one, right? So I don't have to really go to an ex a money exchanger every time, yeah? Is the technology ready for something like that? I don't know, number one. Number two, if I travel a lot and I go to McDonald's in Singapore and I have to figure out how much does it cost in a Singapore dollar, then I go to another place in Vietnam and then, I, oh, now I have to calculate is, you know, what's the price and how is it? And so it, it, it takes care of uh, a lot of that piece, right? So you have a kind of single, uh, single denominator that you can actually peg things again. I'm not saying that, hey, you'll suddenly find fiat going away. No, I don't think so. But what, you, what, I, what I think will happen is the tokenization even of the fiat. So the underlying, so if you're using Bitcoin and, and, and let's say you need to pay for a $10 meal, you don't really divide the Bitcoin, divide it by the, the fiat and actually start to pay that out. That's all taken care underneath by the underlying technology, right? It automatically calculates the exchange value, goes, it sells that little piece of Bitcoin for you, comes back and then pays the merchant. So that all is taken care. So, you know, from a user perspective, you don't have to worry about that, right? But what it allows you to do is the convenience, number one. Number two, it's a global registry. It's a, it's a decentralized open registry where, yeah, everyone, it's, everything is recorded there, it's transparent and everyone can see, right? A number of other features, yeah. Just, just, you know, just to share a couple here uh, <laughs> that address your, your point. point is that there can be, you know, uh, uh, play for tokens or some kind of cryptocurrency. Yep. Some form of exchange of value. Yeah, but my point is just by to, yeah. we, we travel, you know, overseas these days very often, and we carry our credit card. It would just do the exchange automatically for us. And that's the next point. Do you know how much your credit card company charges you? Well, American Express. I use American Express. I use the most very little, very little, very, very little compared to that. Absolutely. So I know a couple of companies in Singapore that are also doing the remittance things. And if, you, if, if you're using something like uh, Western Union and things like that, and you're using two uh, non-easily -convert non convertible currencies, the rate can be as high as close to double digit even. If you're trying to exchange swap to non-easily convertible, if you're of course doing US dollar versus Singapore dollar, the pip is very small, but try doing two non-convertible ones and it's, it's large, much larger. So yeah, efficiency. <laughs> Actually, they charge you twice because the credit card charges you once and your bank charges you again. It's a, it's a two-way charge. Yeah, but um, what's the exchange rate there for Bitcoin nowadays? I think it's probably around 3%, something like that. On the exchanges? No, no, much lower, much lower. Lower than single digit, uh, it's lower than 1%. Unless you're trying to do it OTC over the counter, then it's, then, then it's the wild, wild west, whatever you pay. But yeah, otherwise, no, very low. So a number of these, and, and again, it's not one or two of these, but a combination of these, right? Uh, the last but not the least is uh, where, why would I want to swap out of a very stable uh, fiat currency? There are lots of places in this world that barely have a fiat currency left, right? Uh, places like Zimbabwe, you know what happened there to their currency. Places like Venezuela today, you know what's happening to their currency and uh, and and... They're trying, I know, they're, they're, they're doing it the wrong way, so no. They are trying to put it against the petrodollar, just, they've got fuel, so we'll, you know, sell. No, that, that, that's not the right way, but yeah, they're trying something, but there are places that could use this, right? In Singapore, we don't need that right away. There are, uh, you know, there, there are benefits, but probably not that much, but there are a lot of places in the world that could definitely find, uh, uh, you know, 
take us for uh, something like this, uh, a completely digital, easily swappable uh, currency. Sorry, done. So, uh, so, so question, just, just so that I can get this conceptually straight. So uh, Singapore Airlines is going to be issuing tokens, right? That's the tokenizing they are uh, frequent flyer, they are, they are loyalty program. So does this mean that I can take Singapore or I could one day use my Singapore airline miles to go and buy a cup of coffee? So here's the thing, and that's what needs to evolve, right? So tomorrow, if it is an, it's a token right. and it's on a public blockchain, right. I can go and swap it for a Bitcoin. I can go and swap it for a Litecoin. I can swap it for uh, Ripple. Right. And then I can go to any shop that accepts one of these currencies and just pay for that. Tomorrow, what you'll also see is wallets, right? right. Where, where you can have different types of cryptos or different type of currency inside it. And you simply go and you pay for it and the wallet takes care. So what it does is uh, the very at a very basic grassroots level, it takes your crypto, goes and sells it on the exchange at the prevalent rate, returns the fiat and transfers the fiat into the merchant's uh, account. So the merchant really doesn't care because he gets his Singapore dollars or whatever he's looking for, right? What, what needs to happen is those tokens need to be swappable on an exchange somewhere. Then it could be any token, right? It could be a coffee shop token. It could even be, you know, your hawker center token for that matter. All you basically do is be able to swap, have, a, have, have the ability to swap that into something that's more acceptable. So will this uh, rely on uh, Singapore <coughs> Airlines uh, uh, implicit promise to redeem uh, these miles that has been traded at the exchange for airline seats. I don't have all the details on what Singapore Airline is doing, but if they issued a token, right. uh, for example, and that token is exchangeable on, an ex on, on any exchange, forget the airline seat. I'll just go and swap them for Bitcoin <laughs> or something. <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, if it is f easily tradable or for Starbucks coins, and then I just go and buy coffee. So. And if I want seats, of course, that's on their own system, right? But imagine now if all the airlines do this, and I have a few Singapore Airlines, a few in Cathay, a few in this, and I decide tomorrow I want to fly on Vietjet, I just go and swap all those tokens on an exchange to buy Vietjet tokens, and then redeem those tokens, Vietjet tokens on Vietjet Airlines for a ticket to Seapel or to uh, wherever. So, so, so one thing that, that, that comes to mind is that um, um, frequent flyer miles are at, at present quite tightly controlled, right? I can't freely transfer it to other people uh, without, um, uh, without a lot of paperwork. Manually, yes, it's all, man yeah. So if, if these miles go on the, onto the open exchange and then we have uh, like the next George Soros playing uh, financial wizardry on these tokens. Yeah, no, but it has to make economic sense for him to do that right yeah. so what if somebody with you know one of these guys goes and takes up all the tokens right, right. and so uh, yeah but it needs to make economic sense and if he does that the only thing it will do is drive the price of the token up so whoever is still holding the token is ridiculously rich and can fly free for the rest of for the rest of the year or whatever right yeah. so yeah that's possible but then uh, again, uh, there's, there's a new kind of field emerging, which is like token, tokenomics or token economics, which kind of, you know, where you look at, so uh, how do you manage this? How many tokens do you have in play and how many does the issuing, remember Singapore Airlines will continue to issue tokens to you. So it's not like they're stopping issuing, right? They will continue to issue every time you fly. So is he going to keep just buying those out and then, no, nah, I don't think so. So, yeah. Uh, uh, because it almost seems like uh, these, these entities will then have a, uh, um, have an added responsibility of being a, say a fractional reserve bank of some sort. Because then they have to manage the value of the tokens that they issue so that it doesn't affect. No, uh, uh, yeah, but usually after it becomes, you know, credibly large and it reads, uh, it, it reaches a kind of a, uh, you, you have, you know, a decent volume and things like that and it's fairly liquid and it's, it's spread around. So it's not, not just among 10 people every day, thousands of people are flying. So thousands of people come into the ecosystem. It kind of, uh, market dynamics take over and it kind of uh, falls in place. Yeah, but if somebody for some reason sees value in buying those tokens or wants to kind of 
you know, let's say I, I, I want to throw a birthday party on a Singapore airline, A380, and I just want to rack up enough tokens to pay. At some stage, it might be just cheaper to go and buy the seats, right, at a discounted price or something, rather than try to ratchet up that many tokens from an open market, which will drive the price up. But remember, I'm the guy paying for all the high price, right? The people will happily liquidate at a higher price. If, 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 if you're getting a dollar for every point you have on Singapore Airlines, you'll liquidate now. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, I don't have the details of the program and how they're planning to do it. Is it within a closed system or is it more from a, from a public system? But yeah, you will see these things emerge, right? Which allows me to use my airline miles in a coffee shop and vice versa, only because there's a, there's a, cent, uh, there's a kind of intermediary that, can, that facilitates that swap. Okay. So uh, uh, another quick question. Um, uh, basically, um, can we wrap up? I'm really sorry. But we do have sorry, last question. question. No, no, I'm going to have to cut it off. We'll take that offline. Can he ask one? He, he, he just put it's it up. Uh, it's okay. I'll get in touch with you. It's fine. I think we've got to get it. No worries. Great. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate it. Um, before our last speaker, can we give a round of applause?